And what I want us to think about tonight is, so what does it mean when the Bible says that we are people who, who don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God? If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Exodus chapter 16. The main text we're going to look at is in 2 Timothy, but I want to start and give you a, a brief tour on the way to 2 Timothy. So start with me in Exodus, second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 16. God has indeed designed our lives that we might be a people who seek him in the morning and, and learn to walk in his ways as a result. I want you to see this. I want you to connect even the words that we just sang with God's design for his, his people from the very beginning of the Old Testament. I told the story of, of manna, bread from heaven, appearing on the ground to nourish and sustain God's people in the wilderness. I want to show you why God did this. I want to show you why God led his people into the wilderness and then ordained that they would be fed this way with bread from heaven. Listen to, and you might underline some of these verses. We're going to look at three. We're going to take three stops on the way to 2 Timothy 3 because I want you to see, I want you to see how God has worked among his people when it pertains to what we're going to talk about tonight. Exodus chapter 16 verse 4 says, The Lord said to Moses, this was when they were grumbling because they didn't have food. He said, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I, now here's the purpose, so that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. What God was doing in this picture of the manna was he was testing them. He was teaching them to walk in his law, to depend on provision from him and to trust in his word to them on a daily basis. He's teaching them to walk with him, to trust in his word and his provision to them. Now, flip over to the right a few pages. You'll go, you'll go past Leviticus Numbers, come to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. So, so God does this every day for 40 years. He, he feeds them and sustains them this way in the wilderness. And then in Deuteronomy, what you have is the people of God about to now go into the promised land where there will be an abundance of food. And so, I want you to listen to how God recounts what he's done and again emphasizes why he's done it. We'll start in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. Key verse, though, is in verse 3. God said to his people, the whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So that recounts kind of what we had seen in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Now listen to verse 3. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, so that he might make you know, and this is key phrase, that man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. God did this whole man of thing to teach his people that their dependence on his word was deeper than their dependence on their, their need for food. He was teaching them to depend, to be sustained, even more than by food, to be sustained by his word. Now that leads us to stop number three. Go with me to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 4. So God has been teaching his people in this way in the Old Testament. You get to Matthew chapter 4, and this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Actually, before he begins his ministry, and he is in the desert being tempted by the devil. So he's in the wilderness now, and he's... He's fasted for 40 days. He has not eaten for 40 days when we come to this passage. Listen to verse 1 of Matthew chapter 4. 
It says Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. So same picture, Exodus 16, people of God in the wilderness. Now Jesus, the Son of God, in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2 says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That must be the most, the largest understatement in all of Scripture. Just simple as that. He was hungry. Yes, he was really hungry. Verse 3, the tempter came and said to him then, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus quotes from where? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he says to the devil, to the tempter, he says, my sustenance is deeper than even my physical need for food after 40 days. I live on every word that comes from the mouth of the Father. So what does that mean? What does it mean for us to be a people who don't live on bread alone. And bread, a picture of, of obviously food. The reality that all of us have built into our stomachs, into our bodies, a craving, a desire daily for food. If you have not had, had dinner tonight, you have a, have a craving. We'll have a craving over the next couple of hours for something to eat. It happens all throughout the day. It feels like in the holidays, it's like happening all the time. And you just fulfill the craving every time you get a chance. And eat, eat, eat. But... But we've been created with this in our bodies, and, and yet Scripture is saying that we have, we have a deeper need within us, and even for bread, that more important than breakfast, more important than lunch, more important than dinner, we need the Word of God from His mouth. That leads to 2 Timothy chapter 3, which is where we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna camp out tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 14. I want to show you what it means to live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. How does, that, how does that play out? And I want you to see it in Paul's words to Timothy. This is a letter he wrote to Timothy when Paul was in prison, literally coming to the end of his life. He is about to lose his life for the gospel. And he's writing this, some of his last words that he pens, which is key. You think about the magnitude. When it comes to you've got days left, in your life? What do you want to write down? What do you want to make sure is there now that you're coming to the end? And so, so this is what he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. As for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. What does it mean to live off of every word that comes from the mouth of God? You've got this in your notes, and we're going we're to go through this pretty, pretty swiftly, but I just want you to see this text is packed full. What does it mean to live on every word that comes from the mouth of God? It means that God's word, first of all, is supreme among us. That more important than the basic daily necessity of food, than our most basic needs in this world, our most basic desires in this world, instincts in this world, more important than that is our need for and desire for this word. In a few different ways, a couple different ways. First, God's word is supreme among us in our homes. Did you hear what Paul said to Timothy in verse 14? He said, as for you, continue in what you've learned and have believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And that's a reference. You go back to the first chapter of this, of this letter, this book, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And Paul had said back there, I'm reminded, Timothy, of your faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. The whole picture in Timothy, Timothy's life that Paul has already pointed us to is the fact that the word had been passed on to him, first by his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Like this had been passed down to him in his home. And this is, you see this in, in Deuteronomy? You see God saying, put, put the word everywhere in your home. Put it on doorposts, thresholds of your homes. Surround your home. Fill your home with, with my 
with my word. And this is where I want to say to, especially to every parent in this room. Do not starve your children. Don't starve your children. Now, it would be inconceivable for a parent in this room to intentionally, physically starve their children of, of food. Physical food. The inconceivable. And what I want us to see tonight is that more than physical food, our children need spiritual food of the Word. And yet we, if we're not careful, can become very content with starving them of that which they need most. The reality is you, you can feed your children physical food for 20 years in your home, or if they're there longer than 20, well, however many years. You can feed them physical food alone for all of those years, and they will still go to hell. This is the food that lasts. This is the food that will sustain them for all of eternity that will never pass away. Do not rob your children of immersion in this word and in the process absolutely starve them in this world. Like yesterday we, we were doing gifts and, I, and I, I, gave, I gave Caleb a baseball bat. T-ball is around the corner. And so we were jumping in the T-ball so he had a baseball bat and some batting gloves. He, he wore the batting gloves all day long. We couldn't go outside to swing the bat. He tried to swing it inside, which was not a good idea. So we put the bat away. And then, then he wore the gloves. He, th this afternoon, he was, as soon as we got home uh, from worship gathering this morning, he put his batting gloves on. <laughs> like, he, he's excited. I'm excited. It's kind of going to be fun. But, oh, the last thing I want to do is to teach my son how to swing a bat better than he can, than he can wield this word. And we know that in our culture, let's be honest, in our culture, we are tempted at every turn to teach our children to be good at this sport or that activity, this talent, this skill. We pour hours of time and energy and money and effort into them doing all of these things in the world well. If they have all the stats and all the accomplishments, the reality is in the end, all of it's going to burn up. The one thing that will matter is can they wield this word? And if people who believe that will make this word central in their homes, this is not the primary responsibility of a pastor or children's minister or youth minister or this teacher or that teacher, mom or dad. It is your primary responsibility to pour your word, pour this word into your children in your homes. Don't starve them. Feed them, fill them with this word. Let Timothy's legacy be the legacy of your life, your children's lives as a result of your parenting. Make the word supreme. Fill. More important than you getting your children breakfast tomorrow is you getting your children the word. And more important than you getting lunch and a dinner on the table is you filling them with this word. God's word is supreme among us in our homes and in the, in the church. Paul's writing to Timothy here, who's a leader in the church, and he's writing to him about church leadership. And so when you get to the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, now he's coming to the end of his life. Sum it up here, Paul. And Paul says, one command I give you. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word. Teach the word. Because if you don't, listen to verse 3 in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Read this with you. Tell me if this is not a commentary, not just on our culture, but, but on the church in our day. 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Oh, the word must be central in the church, in this community of faith. Because if it is not, then we will wander off into all kinds of ideas and opinions and thoughts that sound good to us but lead to destruction. This is what we are prone to do. We need the word to be supreme in, in the church. That anything I say, anything anybody else says in exhorting us to action or to do this or that, it must be based on the word. If it is not, then we are wasting our time. It's all hollow if it's not coming back to this, this word. This is what sustains and strengthens. It's supreme among us. 
in our homes and in the church. Second, it's sanctifying in us. Sanctifying means it, it makes us holy. It makes us like Christ. I want you to listen to, to in these couple short verses here, all the benefits of the word that are brought about in our lives. First, the word saves us. God's word saves us. His word is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Yes. Now, I want to be careful with that wording, God's word saves us. The reality is God saves us by his grace through faith. But it's faith in what? It's faith in his word. We don't just make up a plan of salvation. No, that plan is revealed in this word, and we trust in God's word. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's the word of God that shows us how to be saved. And this is, this is huge because, oh, I think about even, even kids in this room, kids in our lives, like we, we have this really dangerous tendency in, in our day to take the word of God, and we want to make it understandable to, to children And so we will begin to leave the words of Scripture behind and begin to make up words like accept Jesus into your life or invite Christ into your heart or pray this prayer after. You don't see these words in Scripture. And so so we need to be very careful not to begin to take that which is so important, salvation, eternal destiny, and begin to play with it into our own thoughts and ideas. Yes, we want to help people understand it, but let's, let's stick with the word. Like repent, believe. These are good words. The last thing we want to do is try to make the gospel as palatable to people as possible and lead them to put their faith in our words instead of God's word. It's God's word alone that leads to salvation. It's God's word that says there is an infinitely holy God and you and I have sinned against him. We have rebelled against him at the core of who we are. We are dead in sin. This is what the Bible says. Not just we've done some things wrong here or there in our lives. No, we are dead in our sin. We are children of wrath, deserving the judgment of a holy God upon us. And God, in his mercy, has sent his son, God in the flesh, and we celebrated his coming yesterday, to to go to the cross and to bear the judgment of God, do your sin and my sin upon himself. And he has died on the cross for our sins. He has risen from the grave in victory over sins so that anyone who, who repents, who turns from sin and turns from themselves and believes and trusts in Jesus will be saved from your sins for all of eternity. I, that's, that's good. You don't, you don't need to change that. Let's just share that and let's trust that this is how God will lead people to salvation. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted in in Christ to forgive you of your sins. Hear the word of God there and see that that his mercy is available to you. So, So God's word saves us. And then, again, then God's word educates us. All right, I'm smelling this back here. I'm gonna check on the bread. Okay, I think it is about ready. I, the last thing I want to do, don't, I, don't, I don't want to get caught up in preaching and this stuff burn behind me. So we'll uh, pull this out. We'll get to that in just a minute. All right, God's Word educates us. It teaches us. It's profitable for teaching. And oh, this is so key, that we let the Word of God teach, teach us. Because we have, we need to learn how to study the Word of God rightly. We need to learn how to, to not take the Word and twist it and use it and abuse it in ways that, that fit us. Isn't this a, a, constant, a constant danger for us? To take the word of God and instead of allowing it to teach us, for us to teach it, for us to say, well, that really doesn't fit with my preferences or my traditions or what is comfortable for me. And so I'm going to twist it to, 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 be, to fit me instead of adjusting my life to fit, to fit it. And we need to learn how to handle this word rightly, to be taught by it. I remember, I was thinking about it yesterday. This is a story I told a while ago at Brook Hills. It had been a few years ago, but I was thinking about it yesterday because it deals with, with, with Christmas. So I was in eighth grade, and, and it was coming up on basketball tryouts for the eighth grade school basketball team. And everybody who was on the, 
Everybody was cool was on the eighth grade basketball team, so I thought I gotta be cool, so I need to be on the eighth grade basketball team. The only problem was I was a little four foot nothing runt, shorter than everybody else in the eighth grade. And so that's not a good thing when you play basketball because every time you throw the ball up, it comes back in your face. And so I was really concerned, how am I gonna make this team? And, and so one day, now this, this is a true story. You're not going to believe this story is true, but I, I promise you, every single detail of the story I'm about to tell you is totally true. So what happens, I'm sitting one day with my Bible and the tie-in with Christmas, Luke 137, which is when God is speaking to Mary about, about virgin birth and the, the verses, Luke 137 says, nothing is impossible with God. Now that clearly is talking about a, a virgin birth, but I began to apply it to basketball. And so here's what went through my head. It was like the words of page of, of scripture had left up, off the page and into my heart. And immediately my first thought was, if that's true, if nothing is impossible with God, then that means I could dunk the basketball. And if I can dunk the basketball, then certainly coach would put me on the team. I mean, what four-foot kid can dunk the basketball? And so, true story, I left the Bible sitting there in my room, and I went outside and grabbed a, a basketball. We had a basketball goal in our driveway. And so I went to the back of the driveway, way back, because I was going to get a running start. And I got down on my knees, and I said, God, I believe with your power and your strength that I can dunk this basketball. Nothing is impossible with you. Now, I wanted everything to be perfect, and so I planned out how many steps it was gonna take for me to get from the back of the driveway up to the goal, and then, I, so I was timing my steps, and then my plan was when I was about two feet away, I was gonna close my eyes. Okay, follow with me here. I'm gonna close my eyes, I'm gonna take the last two steps with my eyes closed, and I'm gonna jump with my eyes closed. That way, that way I could picture the angels lifting me up to the goal. So. Gabriel and Michael, I mean, these guys were there, and then Luke, so why not, might as well be there here. So, so they're going to lift me up to the goal. The next thing I'm going to feel is the rim. I'm going to throw the ball through the rim, and then I'm going to hang up there because I've never been there before. So that is, that is my plan. And so I, I go back to the back of the driveway. One more time, on my knees, I'm praying. I'm cars driving by, people walking by. They're having normal days. I'm having revival right there in the driveway. Lord, just believe I can do this. Totally true story. I start running as hard as I can. I get two feet away and I close my eyes. And I take the last two steps with my eyes closed and, and I jump. I, I could feel something on my left and on my right. And in the very next instant, I felt that basketball pole right in my forehead, right there. <laughs> I want you to imagine walking by my house on that particular day. <laughs> I want you to imagine seeing a little kid get up off his knees, supposedly in prayer, and <laughs> go running as hard as he could and jump into a basketball pole. <laughs> so, so, oh, all right, so I had the heart, right? I had the heart. And it's not that God's word is not true. This text is talking about a virgin birth, not an eighth grade four foot nothing kid being able to dunk a basketball. And so we need to know. We need to know how to be taught by this word. How to, how to learn this word. And in the process, okay, so God's word educates us. It convicts us. So this is what God's word does. It, it reproves us. It says, Scripture is profitable for teaching for reproof, which is literally conviction. It when we begin to veer off of that which is good for us and glorifying to God, we are convicted as his people. We, we have an emotional response where we feel bad for what we've done. We realize, oh, I've messed up. And this is a gloriously wonderful thing. Now, we don't think about conviction that way. We think, oh, who, and who likes to feel horrible for what they've done or... To be caught doing something wrong, and, and yes, certainly it would be better if we hadn't done it in the first place, but I want you to see the astounding grace of God in conviction. It is a very good thing that we have a Father in heaven who when we begin to step off of the track that is good for us, that he pulls us back. 
And it keeps us from going that direction. Every single one of us in this room is thankful for any loving discipline that we have received from parents in our lives that has kept us from going, kept me from going off in my four or five or six year old ways. And to know that we have a Father in heaven who desires our good more than we do. And is absolutely committed in his word when we begin to stray to pull us back. But the problem is, if we're not in his word, feasting on his word on a daily basis, then we begin to wander and we continue to wander. And we don't have this word that is being hidden in our heart that is pulling us back. The word convicts us and the word corrects us. It doesn't just pull us back. The word guides us forward, gives us a path Psalm 1, 1932, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. They guide us and they lead us. I, I was thinking about, uh, talking about loving parental discipline. Uh, there's all kinds of, obviously, stories uh, of how that plays out in, in our home, and most of them I do not share. But, but, but this one, over the last couple of months, has been really special for us because our, our two-year-old, now three-year-old, just turned three a couple weeks ago, um, Joshua, for, for a while, started doing this thing where he would wake up in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, and he would begin to scream and yell for, for myself or Heather to come and to take him to the, to the restroom. And the reality is, Buddy can go to the bathroom by himself. Like, he knows how to do this. And so there was no need for him to, I have better things going on in 2 o'clock in the morning than helping him go. And, and, and so we would, we would sit down with him the next morning and try to reason with him. And that wasn't working. We, we were just trying all these different things. And then my, my precious and brilliant wife decided she was, she was going to do some pictures. And so we took his bed. And, and he now has, they're about, each about, about this big, but six pictures. There's actually seven. I'll tell you about the seventh in a second. Six pictures that are on his bed that outline a step-by-step -step process for what he should do when he wakes up in the middle of the night for, for what for what, what is a better response. And so the first picture says, get out of bed. And it has a little kid getting out of bed. Second picture, open the door. Like it is precise. Like get out of bed in your room, now go open the door. Go to the bathroom and then so on and so on. It's got little pictures, little, little, little guy doing what he needs to do and then come back, close the door, get into bed. And so if you were to ask Joshua, I mean, if he was here right now, you could ask him, what, what, what do you do if you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night? And he will quote, I mean, every single one. And then the seventh picture, this is my favorite, these are all little small pictures, but then this one is the, the whole eight and a half by 11 piece of paper on the end of his headboard. And what it is, it's, it's a picture of a, of a little boy with his mouth wide open screaming and then a big no sign around it. So this is what my son wakes up to every morning is this picture of do not scream. And, and so it's, it worked. Like, he is, he's not, it's not doing anymore. I mean, you wake up the next morning, do you get up in the middle of the night? Yes. I got up out of my bed, I went and opened the door, and I did this and this and this, and I didn't scream and yell for mommy and daddy. Yes. So this is what the Word does for us. This Word, that's what it does. Yes, it corrects us, but, uh, yes, it, it, it convicts us, but then it corrects us. It says, here's the path to walk in, and this is a good, good path. And, and we miss it. If we're, if we're not feeding on it and feasting on it. So, okay, the word educates, convicts, saves, educates, convicts, corrects. The word instructs us. It trains us in righteousness. Oh, this is beautiful. God's word is not just given us for information. It's given us for transformation. This word has supernatural power by the Spirit of God to conform our hearts and our minds and our lives into the likeness of Christ. We're going to talk about this some more next week, but just to give you a real quick preview, I know, I know that there are people in this room who are walking through a variety of different struggles in your life that are not specifically addressed in this book. Whether it's divorce recovery, dealing with grief, parenting teenagers, struggling with what to do in this economy, what happens when, when that which you'd saved up is gone. Now, the temptation is, in light of some of these practical things that we face that are not easy, to say, well, then why, why do I need to sit and study about the Israelites and the Moabites? And we may not say that, but I mean, what, what does that really have to do with my life? And here, here's why. 
Here's why we read about the Israelites and the Moabites. Because reading about the Israelites and Moabites is going to teach us about who God is. And by the Spirit of God, it's going to be used to conform our hearts and our minds and our desires to look more like Christ. To be more in touch with the Holy Spirit of God who, get this, the Holy Spirit of God who, who will walk with you through every bit of divorce recovery and grief who will lead and guide you in every decision you make in parenting teenagers and every financial hurdle that you come to. The best thing for us is to be conformed to the likeness of Christ in any and every situation we face. And that's what the Word does. It trains us to walk in righteousness. And that's why this book is so valuable. It trains us, instructs us, and ultimately it equips us. Verse 17 says, so that the man of God, woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. It's equipment. No, think football. No, no football player is going to go into a game without the proper equipment. No, think your job. You're not going to go to your job and be able to work unless you're equipped, unless you have different gifts and skills, a set of things that enable you to do your job. Well, this is, this, is, this is what equips us, this word. And We want to glorify Christ in our marriages, then we need to be equipped. We want to glorify Christ in our parenting, in our homes. We need to be equipped. We want to glorify Christ in our work and in our lives. We want to glorify Christ in Birmingham. We want to glorify His name in all nations. And we must, must be equipped. The beauty is God's word does all of that. This, this. This word is good. Supreme among us, sanctified. This is why it's more important than breakfast or lunch or dinner. Last two, God's word is sufficient for us. That's really part of the, the whole point of the manna and God's daily provision of bread because he was teaching his people, just as we sang every morning, to wake up and to know my my sustenance is based on the provision of God today. And the provision of God is most clearly seen in his word. Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Literally daily bread teaching them. The problem was in Exodus chapter 16 is that the people of God in the wilderness did not trust God. And, and I, my prayer is for your life, for my life, for our life together as a faith family, my prayer is that we we would be a people who, who trust his word. Let's, let's trust his word. Let's believe that in this book, God has indeed given us everything we need for life and godliness, and that it is good, and that it's our guide. You know, we, over the last year, radical experiment, but longer than that, over the last couple of years, we, we've walked through some difficult truths and some difficult texts in Scripture. When Jesus says, you must give up everything you have to follow me. And what does that mean in this culture? Give up everything you have. When he says to some people, not all, but some, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor. And the reality that he could be saying that to any one of us in this room and really to wrestle with those kind of truths. And we've, we've been walking on a journey. We've been wrestling with that kind of stuff. And, you know, to be completely honest... I think we as a church are only at the tip of the iceberg for what all of this means for our lives and our church in this culture. I think we've only begun to explore what it means to really follow the, the Jesus of this Bible. Not, not adjusting him to fit us, but adjusting ourselves to to align with him and his word. I think we're only at the beginning. And, I, and that, now I say that, and I, I'm guessing for some that almost sounds a bit frightening because, because I know that some of the things we've walked through over the last couple of years have not necessarily always been easy to walk through. And she's saying, oh, more. Like, but, but this is where I want to remind us. This word is good. It can absolutely and wholeheartedly be trusted to lead us. And we are always prone to think that our ways are better. And we are always prone to find our comfort more in the ways of this world 
and in the ways of this word. But I want to, I want to show us, this is at the core a heart issue. And the question before us constantly as a church as we move forward in our lives and our families is are we going to trust this word? And when it says do this, are we going to do that? Are we going to trust that God has designed, given us his word for our good and for his glory? And when we do, we can trust him to lead us. Yes, in a way that is absolutely contrary to the way this world thinks. And that is uncomfortable and not always easy. But it is better. It is so much better because it's his word. Let's trust his word. It is sufficient for us. Let's trust in God's word. And then God's word is satisfying to us. God's word is satisfying to us. So it's sufficient for us. Let's trust in it. It's satisfying to us. This word is to be desired more than gold, Psalm 19 says. It's more, more precious than fine gold is the word of God. Oh, do we believe that? Like this last year, we've had each week, we've designed reading through the Bible, where we have a Bible reading plan, which by the way, just as a side note, uh, we're going we're gonna to finish up this chronological reading through Scripture this next, next Sunday. This is our last week. We're going to finish up in Revelation uh, next Sunday. And then we'll kind of have like a week off in there where obviously feel free. Well, you can at any time feel free to read anywhere in the Bible that you want. That's great. But if, if you want to follow along as a faith family in, in Bible reading, we're going to start up a new plan on January 9th where it's going to be different, a lot different, because we're not going to be reading chronologically through Scripture the next year. Instead, like in the beginning of the year, we're going to be in the book of Acts. And so we'll have during that week selected passages in Acts. It'll be a lot shorter, a little less intense than this last year, um, but giving a little more time to meditate and to study a passage of Scripture and supplemental passages. So anyway, we'll talk about that more later. But we, we have a, a daily Bible reading plan. As, as a church, so we can walk through the word together. If, if that is beneficial, profitable, we want to encourage feeding on the word of God. But then part of that also is a memory verse every week. And I know, I know that people think about this more than fine gold. Like people think, oh, I just can't memorize scripture. And, and certainly different, different people in this room have different abilities when it comes to memorization. But the reality is, like, if I were to tell you that I'd give you $1,000 for every verse you can memorize in 2011, like, I got a feeling most everybody could memorize some scripture. Like, if Jesus wept, 1000 bucks. I mean, this, is, this, this could work. I guess, I guess the real question is, is this word more important to us than our money? Do we believe it's, it's more valuable than and pieces of paper and currency in our culture. Oh, it absolutely is more valuable. There's, it is sweeter than honey. The, the word talks about itself with such great reward. I mean, you think about it. With Reward is an enticing and powerful thing. My sons will eat just about anything put on their plate when they know a brownie or banana pudding is coming at the end. Like, they, they will endure whatever this is. And that can be a dangerous thing. But, but to see, yes, there is reward. This is good. Oh, this is so much better. This is, the word is not something that is intended for us to, to be a duty as much as it is a delight to be in this word. To hunger for it. That's the whole imagery here. To live not on bread, but on every word that comes from his mouth. How do we, you know, I know that some, some might be thinking, well, I don't really have a hunger for God's word, a desire for God's word. Here's the key. If you want a hunger for God's word, you want a deeper desire for God's word. Here's the key. Ready? If you want a deeper desire for God's word in your heart, here's how you do it. You, you read God's word. That's it. You read it. Like, I think about, I think about, and I've, I've told this before, when, when Heather and I started dating, I grew up in a house where we never ate seafood. My dad didn't like seafood, so we wanted nothing to do with seafood. Well, the first time I go over to her house, her family fixes seafood, and I don't want to 
on a gag at the table. And so I choked down the seafood. And, you know, after every bite, I'm going overboard. Oh, this is so wonderful. I'm convincing myself. This is wonderful. And so I'm just telling them how great the seafood is. Well, the problem is they bought it. And so every time after that, they thought, well, Dave's coming over. Well, let's have seafood. He loves seafood, clearly. So, so I mean, it was, it was consistent. I'd, I'd go on vacation with her family, and, and we'd be down at the beach. They're like, well, Dave, what are your favorite seafood restaurants? And I'm like, well... All of them are great. Like, I just love them all. And so every night it was like this feast of seafood. Well, the deal is now I like seafood because I had, I had to eat seafood. Like, now, I'm not saying that this word is okay, just stick with it, although it doesn't taste good. But the reality is, the reality is a, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't have a hunger for God's word when we're filling our minds all day long with TV and football games and shows and internet and movies and all this stuff, when our stomachs are full with the world, it's no surprise that we have no desire for the Word. Yet I guarantee you, you begin, you begin to feast on this Word and you will see that it's better. It's better than football and it's better than... TV and movies, and it's better than all the stuff we fill our minds with and the internet. It, this, is, this is better. And what happens is you begin to see this is better. And you begin to taste these things of the world. And you say, that's nowhere near as good. And that's, that's my prayer for us continually. My life, for your life, for this church, that we would long for, desire this word more and more and more and more. There are treasures, delights to be found here for for all of eternity. And it, it is, it is worth. So let's, let's trust in God's word because it's sufficient for us. And let's feast on it because it's satisfying to us. Let's feast on it daily in our homes, in our lives. And then weekly, let's come together and, and feast, feast on it. And this is where we come back to the, the whole point here. That, that is why we have this imagery of, of bread all throughout Scripture, pointing us to the reality that yes, yes, we have in us something innate when it comes to food that God has created us with that says, I desire food. When I, there was a guy sitting on the front row this morning that was like, I was not a big fan of smelling this the whole time we were sitting in there. But there's something in us that says, yes, I, I want, I want food. And what I want to point you to tonight is the reality that there is a deeper craving in your soul that is so much more important than getting breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And it is a craving for this word. And God has designed us as his people not to live on bread alone, 